Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ridgely Baptist Youth Wednesday Night Awesome Testimonies. With us this evening, we have your favorite Sunday school slash Bible fellowship teacher <laughs> ever, Michelle. Ah, uh, guns up, baby. There we go. <laughs> All right, now you may know Michelle, but do you know Michelle's story? Stick around. Because after this is over, then you'll be like, yeah, I, I, I heard her story. She just she just told it. Michelle, how are you doing this evening? Michelle is good. Michelle's good? Yes, I am. Excellent. All right. So, Michelle, uh, the first question we're going to start with uh, this evening is Michelle away from Jesus. So before oh, you wow. knew Jesus or times you've just spent away from the master, okay. tell us about your life away from Jesus. Well, I have to start with knowing Jesus as a young girl. And when I was 12, I accepted Christ and it was in the Church of Christ. And so there's no music, but lots of singing for a part harmony. And I felt the Lord calling me and I walked down the aisle, which was a really long aisle, all the way to the front. And I filled out my little card. I asked the Lord to be my savior. And they took me in the back. They dunked me, called me baptized, and it was good. All the way through high school, Bible student, in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, went to camp. Senior year of high school, I was most something spiritual girl at camp or something like that, you know, the award thing they give out. So that was really awesome. And then um, college, then came college. And like so many of our students do today, I fell away from the Lord and lived a lifestyle that was totally unbecoming to a young woman of God. And if, if you could name something sinful that a young girl would do, I probably did it. Arson. Oh, man. No. Except for that. Okay. Except for that. Um, um, but Thievery. Oh, oh, man. I didn't steal anything either. Okay. We should just run the commandments. I okay. Didn't kill, <laughs> I didn't kill anyone. I probably coveted it anyway. Did you take so the Lord's name in vain? Oh, I did. <laughs> Unfortunately, I did on occasion. But I will tell you, even while acting so unbecoming and knowing that I was doing wrong, I was very offended by people cursing. That hmm. bothered me. There were a few four letters that came out of my mouth, mm -hmm. but the, anything that had God's name in it was inappropriate. Hmm. And, and I would still call people out on that, and they'd be like, but you just said, <laughs> yeah, but that's God's name, and we don't say that. Okay. And, you know, so yeah. even when I was uh, in far country, which is what I like to call it, hmm. doing my prodigal daughter thing, um, I still knew the Lord was there, but I didn't think he could love me because of the lifestyle that I was living, the people I was hanging around with. And honestly, every headline in the tabloids today, every headline in the news today, I was a part of that. In a distant, distant, well, way, way, way far away past, I was part of that. Um, the lifestyle I lived, the, the friends I hung out with, the things that my, my friends did, unbecoming to a Christian young woman. Um, so when... Um, I felt the Lord pulling me back to him, and coincidentally, it happened when I met my husband, um, who, um, yeah, I met my, my soon-to-be or future husband, and he went to church here originally, and he didn't go to Sunday school. He only went to worship, and he went to worship because coach told him, <laughs> if you don't come to church, you don't get to play softball, and that was a big thing to Don McAdoo at the time. So um, he would come every Sunday to make sure Coach Tarbell saw him so that he could play softball. So. Um, Fast forward a few months, we're engaged to be married, and, and I told Don, I was like, you know what, I really, really, really want to go to Sunday school. And he was like, I don't even have a class. Really? So we tried, we visited. So John and Carol Mooring, I remember them from our son, the Sunday school class we visited. They did not have Jared, of course, at the time, so it was just John and Carol. And then there were you know other couples that we met. So fast forward from there, um, I wanted to teach Sunday school, and I wanted they needed teachers really bad and so I went to the director of the children I said I would love to teach and she said okay um, have you been baptized and I said absolutely well when were you baptized and I was baptized in June of 1972 I was 12 years old she said okay where were you baptized and I said Glen Garden Church of Christ oh put the brakes on girlfriend you got to be rebaptized into the Baptist Church what so they made me be rebaptized. I was not a fan of that because I'd already accepted the Lord. I'd already asked for forgiveness for my sins 
and believe me, there was a list. So anyway, yes, went to, uh, went ahead and went forward and I was baptized and um, began teaching. Taught two year olds, then I taught 18 month old, old, 18 month old children and Jared Morey was one of them. He was one of my 18 month old babies. You should talk to me about my little pony and the diaper I changed that day. Oh mm-hmm. my goodness, that was interesting. Anyway, so it was uh, quite, quite, I know Jared will never, but yeah, he doesn't remember that, but boy yeah. I do, I will never forget that. So that's not part of my testimony, but anyway, Shall we move forward? So moving forward in life, um, when I got to the youth group, my son was still, my oldest son was still in the youth group, and I didn't think he was going to be a fan of his mom being in here, and he wasn't a fan of his mom being with his youth group. But I had the opportunity to be with girls, and it was the biggest, most amazing experience um, I had had to heretofore, and I had taught women. I taught a women's class, and this, but teaching these girls really speaks to my heart because I there was not one thing except arson and thievery that came up <laughs> oh, and murder murder that came up with our girls that I had not experienced I had been there for all of that and every single time I mean and nobody up here knew those things about me nobody knew they knew Michelle McAdoo church lady they didn't know Michelle McAdoo the girl who fell away from the Lord they didn't know her until one by one these girls would come in this room and have all this real life stuff happening to them and I'll be like, oh, man, this means I have to tell that story, doesn't it, Lord? Yes, Michelle, you need to tell the story. And so in Sunday school with the class of girls, I would tell them about the time that I drove drunk the wrong way down, uh, what's the name, Stimmons Freeway in Dallas. It is by the grace of God that I didn't kill someone driving the wrong way drunk on Stimmons Freeway in Dallas or get put in jail, which would have killed my career in the banking industry. I mean, there are so many, there's a litany of things that should have happened to me. But God had a bigger plan for my life. And that plan was for me to take every one of those sorry stories of far country Michelle, the prodigal daughter, and use them to share and draw closer to a girl who didn't think she had anything in common with me. So... That's kind of how that worked. Um, And every single scenario that we have had come up in here, with the exception of murder, arson, and thievery, has applied to me with our girls. And so it is a very, I have a very passionate heart for these girls because I love them. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the story of Michelle McAdoo. What else do you want to know? Well, now, in your in your Christian life, certainly there was your time in the far country, but uh, you you did get a little up close and personal with murder, did you not? I did. Oh, we want to hear that story. Okay, yes, I did. Okay, so yes, my mother was murdered. She was murdered at our home, and uh, my dad's best friend was at the house. He and my dad were going to do some work together. He was killed also. My dad was not, and so my dad was accused of murder, and um, he went to prison for seven years. So I went from a 20-year-old with no responsibilities up except for my job uh, at the bank to being responsible for our home and my father's care away from home and all of the other responsibilities that I was totally unprepared for. Because remember, I was in far country at that time. And while I was living in far country, pretty much the world revolved around this. It all revolved around me and everything was about me. So when this happened, it just pulled the rug out from under who I thought I was. Because all of a sudden, I wasn't Michelle the Golden Girl from Fort Worth Christian School. I was Michelle, the daughter of a murderer, or an accused murderer, and the daughter of a woman who had been murdered in my home. So there are so many things that occurred during those, you know, I would say that 10 year period, basically my 20s were lost. There, were, there, are, there was nothing to my 20s. I grew my hair really super long so that I could do this and hide behind my hair so people wouldn't, have, wouldn't see my face. I was ashamed of who I was as a person. I, and, and I certainly at that time in my life knew God couldn't love me. I even bargained with God and said, hey, if my dad is innocent, great. If my dad is guilty, I want you to send him to prison. Imagine what I thought when he went to prison. That was a really hard time for me. And I learned a really good lesson, a very valuable lesson about bargaining. We don't bargain with God. Um, so I even asked my dad before he went to trial, I was like, Dad, did you kill mom? Did you really do it? And he said, no. He has never lied to me in my life. He has never been kind about words. 
when it was something hard that needed to be said, he was very blunt with it, which is maybe where I get that from now. Um, he never sugarcoated anything with me. I really don't think he did it. I, I have proof in my heart of that, but I'm not gonna take the time to share that with you. But yes, it was a very hard time, but it gave me, um, it gave me a little bit of credibility for students here who have had brushes with the law and gave me a little bit of knowledge as to what they and their families were going through mm -hmm. so that hopefully in some way some small tiny way I could minister to those people because yeah that was a that was a hard 10 years my 20s were terrible and, and just to compound that this father of yours that, yes. that went away to, to prison mm -hmm. um, accused of murdering your mother mm -hmm. was blind yes that is correct and so you that then a, a blind man going to prison has a few extra difficulties attached to that. Oh my word. Okay, which then so this falls on you, right? <laughs> this is interesting. So blind people are supposed to be at this certain unit of the prison. Well, there was no room in the end for him. So he was in the general population, which is also called gen pop, if you want to be really, you know, think about it. But he was in the general population. Well, he couldn't see anything. He didn't know his way around. He had to have a cane. Imagine tapping your little cane down and you tap against the wrong person, mm -hmm. what that would be like. It was really scary for me. Um, and it was a three and a half hour drive and I couldn't go, you can't go every week, you, you know, you have a schedule. So it was very hard for me. It was very uh, trying for me. And instead of looking to the Lord and spending that time to and from in prayer, I spent that time just being sick and nauseous every time I drove mm -hmm. down there not knowing what I would find, every time I came back not knowing what I would find, you know, what I was be dealing with coming back. It was just horrible. So, I mean, there were so many things about that, but God was working the entire time. Dad was able to minister to people. He mm -hmm. was able to show the love of Christ to people while he was in prison. And he met some wonderful people um, while he was there. And he, he lost, we lost my mom's side of the family completely we lost a lot of people on my dad's side of the family he lost all of his dear lifelong friends except for one and um it was a very hard time for him as well and and he and i became much closer after that um, because it was just the two of us basically against the world is what it felt like unbeknownst to me i mean i knew in my heart but god was there the whole time he was watching out for him the whole time. He was never beat up. He was never harmed. He was never abused mm. inappropriately. Um, he was able to earn a lot of privileges because he worked so hard. Um, and so that was good for him, but it was very hard. His pride was, pride was his number one fault and pride has always been my number one fault too. Mm. And God really used that time to bring humility to both of us, which was a good thing. Now you shared with me before that um, you discovered much later that your after your dad was released that he actually had a, a retrial that there was some kind of okay. afterward legal action yes. and he was exonerated. Is that how that worked? Pretty close. So um, I have breast cancer, as as most everybody knows. Wait, wait, wait. And, um, On top of all this other stuff, you mean to tell me you're a cancer survivor? I am. Yeah, I had bald hair. I was bald for a while. It was awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle McAdoo. Cancer survivor. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. You can't beat this woman. Can't touch this. Da, 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 da. Okay. So anyway, um, so yes, I had breast cancer and during the time I was recovering from cancer, my dad had a retrial. He had filed for, uh, I forgot, wrongful conviction or something. He had filed to have his hearing, his trial redone. But he didn't want to do it in Tarrant County because there were some very high profile people involved in his conviction, one of whom was his attorney. And he didn't want the district attorney's office, nor did he want his attorney to be a part of that because of some of the things that occurred during his first trial. So uh, basically they fought because he couldn't see that he couldn't hear. And so in the elevator on more than one occasion, Dad and his attorney would be riding the elevator with the judge and the prosecutor in the same elevator, and they would talk about whose turn it was to win that trial. And there is my dad, the defendant in this trial, in the same elevator. And they either thought he was deaf or stupid. So that was one of, of several things that occurred. Um, so it was reheard in Dallas County. And um, because I was going through the cancer thing, he didn't want to worry me about it. So I did not know that that had happened until um, not too long before he passed away. 
Um, he told me that the trial had been re, re, what do you call that? Reheard, redone, retried. He had been retried and he had been um, acquitted. So the seven years plus the additional two and a half years of drama before the trial uh, were expunged from him, but I mean, it had done its damage. So he had no career, he had no income. My parents, neither one, though they were both blind, never took any government assistance ever in their lives. I was taught that you work for what you get, you work for what you have. Harder you work, the better you do, and you praise God for every blessing that you have because it comes from him, it isn't yours anyway. Um, and he had to start over from scratch, and he did. He became a massage therapist, which is awesome for blind people because they got some touch. Mm -hmm. And he, in fact, knew I was pregnant with Garrett before I knew I was pregnant with Garrett. Boom. So that's just something interesting. But, yeah, awesome guy. He was completely exonerated. He built himself a new life. So when you were away from Jesus, yes. he kind of slow rolled you back in. He did. He and did. in the meantime, you went through all that terrible stuff with your mom being killed and your dad being accused of it and then your dad later being acquitted which means you've got to have some forgiveness issues for your mom's actual killer who is okay. still out there somewhere oh you Good know what mercy. we hadn't talked about the rape yet okay we didn't talk about the rape yet and yeah there was a rape thing i won't get too graphic here because we have guys in the room but um, yes, as a six-year-old little girl, I was raped by my neighbor's son, who was home on leave from the Vietnam War. Um, they lived across the street. She was my babysitter, and he raped me. Um, he bragged about that to his little brother, who also raped me with a broomstick. So I was raped twice, uh, once by a grown man and once by a, a teenage boy. So there was that on top of all this other stuff, which probably nobody really wants to know that, but that's part of my story that makes me who I am. Um, that's another one of those things that I can sure speak to, to young girls. But anyway, I forgot where I was going with this. But um, there was a, I was away from the Lord for a long time. But what I'm getting at with that, I was already uh, walking with Jesus when I found out Dad was exonerated. Um, because that was not too long before he got sick that I found out about that. Um, and it was a total accident that he even told me. And he was like, I wasn't intended to tell you about that. But you're, but so then your your forgiveness or struggle with forgiveness oh, with thank the you. yes yeah. that when you said that struggle for forgiveness, yeah. I had to struggle to forgive the rapist before I could struggle to yeah. forgive my mom's murderer. Mm. And the rapist turns out his sister's best friend worked at the desk next to me at the bank, this other bank I worked at, and she's telling me one day, desk to desk. This is before social distancing. Oh, Michelle, my best friend Cindy and I are going to go do this, this, and this. Oh, how fun. Well, tell me about your friend Cindy. And it turns out Cindy, because I used to know a lady named Cindy, but she was a girl and I was a girl. And we compared notes. And before I knew it, she told me about her two brothers. And she told me their names. And I almost fell out of the chair. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Are their last names? Hmm? Yeah. I said, okay, well, let me tell you about those two brothers. And I told her exactly what happened with those two brothers. And after she picked her mouth up off of the ground, um, she told me that she thought that they had abused Cindy as well. So my struggle to forgive those guys took a long time, especially after talking to her brought it back to my mind, um, which was horrible. And so it took a long time to forgive them. But I, I was able to do that not in my power, not in my strength, but by the grace of God, I was able to forgive those guys. Hmm. And it was that that was a stepping stone to being able to forgive the person that killed my mom. Because by this time, I'm walking with the Lord and I'm seeing God's hand in every area of my life. Because isn't hindsight awesome? You can look back on the past of your life and you can see where God was. Even when you're far away from the Lord, you can see where God is working in your life. And that's what he was doing with me. And I could see in every footstep I made that was away from him, I could see how God was moving. Um, and so it made it honestly easy to forgive the person who killed my mom because I knew that he was in that. And I knew that her death, had she not died, and this is crazy to say, but had she not died the way that she did, I would not be the person I am today because who knows? I mean, who knows? Only God knows what I would have done. But I don't know that I would have the humility or the passion that I have for him 
had my mom not died and I had to not face, I had to, and I had not faced the person that I was. Hmm. God's awesome, man. See that in my experience, there's kind of two big responses when people encounter something terrible in their lives. Um, it's either it's God's fault that he let this happen to me and I hate him because clearly he hates me back mm -hmm. or God's my only way through this. I must cling to him tighter because this is how messed up the world is. Mm -hmm. He's my only way out of here. Um, but there's a third way. Oh, please. There's a third way that people often choose, that people walking with the world choose, and that's that they are their own God and mm -hmm. they know best. And that is the way that I walked. Okay. I knew what was best for Michelle. I knew everything I needed to be doing. I was in control of my life. No one else was going to tell me what to do. And all of these things, that, is, that was me. I knew I was my own God. I was awesome. And I was it. And it took some really bad things for me to humble myself, to realize that I am not God. He is God. And I am totally unworthy to be his child, and he loves me anyway. And that is the truth. So you've been through so much in your life. Thank you so much for, for opening up and sharing these things. I know this is no challenging to have to keep no, keep I telling no, your story again and I again. I got no secrets. I'm good. Um, so clearly you have learned everything that there is to know about life. No. God couldn't possibly be teaching you anything right no. now. No. So Absolutely. what? The good thing is that our, our master is never done with us. No. So what, what would you say right now, this week, this, this month, this season, what is God working on you? This season of my life has been such a season of growth because there is so much more out there. There is a whole other group of people that I have not had a chance to, to work with yet, to minister to yet, and I am just beginning to feel brave enough and empowered enough to write some things down, to share with people that don't know me from Adam, hmm. that don't know where I've been, that, that don't know how to navigate stuff that's hmm. hard. So I feel like that God is, is growing me for something that I'm not sure what that destination is yet. He's got hmm. something else planned for me. I'm not sure what it is yet. I just know that there's something else he has to show me. And I'm waiting to see what it is. Well, Michelle, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your testimony with us. And if, uh, if the Lord has us walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, it is good to know that we should fear no evil because no. his rod and his staff will comfort us they will comfort us and i mean there is nothing to fear i told the kids in sunday school before i would lay down for any one of them if some shooter guy walked into our church today i'd be happy to run toward him and take a bullet for any of these kids i love these kids um i love all the kids that have gone before that are not walking with the lord i still love those kids and i pray for each of you all of you kids i pray for you daily um, every time God brings someone to your heart, to your mind, pray for them. And that's how I think of, of all of our kids. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. That wasn't so hard.